Have you ever heard of exploding head syndrome? Um, no, I don't think that's real. It's real. I mean, if it was real, I don't think they would call it exploding head syndrome. <laughs> First of all, isn't well, a syndrome like something that you, it's like a chronic disorder? Why don't you Google it right now? And as you're Googling it and realizing as WebMD pops up and and a dozen other sources, you'll realize it's a real thing. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, you're yeah, you're right. Um, uh, you know, okay. I thought that it meant your head actually exploded, but uh, it's a kind of sleep disorder. So last night, at like two in the morning, I'm having a dream. You are actually in this dream, which is crazy. Pretty weird, but you are. Uh, We're in some house. I think I'm up in your way, but Duluth is not Duluth. Anyway, like we're just hanging out basically. And then I just hear bow, 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 like 15 super loud gunshots Wow! that wake me up. And I am afraid. I am in this moment of just achieving consciousness Absolutely. I don't know that I'm absolutely certain, but if I were to have to have made a bet in that moment, whether or not the gunshot sounds were real, I would have said, absolutely. Yes, they're real. I got out of bed. I looked around. I was listening for sirens. I was looking out the window for other lights to go on at my neighbor's house. Oh, wow. And it became pretty clear to me pretty quickly that the gunshots that seemed so real were not, in fact, real. That sounds terrifying. It was pretty terrifying. I did what anybody would do, which is try to diagnose through Google, and exploding head syndrome (laughs) (laughs) showed up. So you didn't believe it, but it's real. Yeah, no, I believe you now. Uh, I hope that you don't... I hope when I think of syndrome, I think of like a disorder that you have all the time. I hope you don't regularly experience. I hope it doesn't that. come back. Yeah. Did we explain clearly enough what it is? Oh, I don't think we did. It's uh when you're falling asleep or waking up, you hear loud explosion noises. Do you think that we had exploding head syndrome before explosions were common uh among human beings? That is a fascinating question. I doubt it. Yeah. Uh, it was first reported in the late 19th century. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Okay, let's do the show. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to Zero Sum Empire, the podcast that's taking a critical census of the roughly 540 mostly anonymous American billionaires. Welcome back. Hello, listeners. Wow. Yeah. Hello, listeners. This is episode 14. Yeah. Episode 14. Life is crazy out here for for all of us, but we're committed to showing up. Here we are yet again. (laughs) (laughs) That was really motivational. Great work. Uh, Let's do Billionaires in the News. Billionaires in the News. So we have two main things that we're going to be chatting about for billionaires in the news this week. Is that right? All right. Uh, What what, what should we deal with first? First, uh, we're going to talk about uh, Trump buying Greenland. We don't talk about Trump on this show very much. In fact, we make it a point to to try not to talk about Trump. It just is a really, really depressing topic of conversation. It's very depressing. And it's like every time you you say his name, he's like a kind of medieval demon where like... I don't want to contribute to to whatever energy. Right. It's like every time you say his name, he wins a little bit, right? And so like and it's like uh yeah, yeah it's it's like Rumpelstiltskin kind of thing. I can't remember Rumpelstiltskin. <laughs> I think he actually lost if you said his name. Uh but like it's the same sort of deal. Um but uh this story was just too funny to not talk about. And I, and I don't actually think it is that funny, but it's being covered in that way. I don't think it's funny at oh. all. I think it's actually the scariest thing that's oh, happened. Oh, weird. Okay. What's, well, what's your take on Trump buying Greenland? Well, I mean, to me, it, it suggests like the, the starkest evidence of a real psychotic break that we've seen yet 
since he's taken office. And I don't think it is really a, a psychotic break, but it's so far, like everything is around the bend. Everything is preposterous. It's always each moment of the presidency is more amazing than the last. But this somehow takes everything to a new level for me. I just wow. don't understand how that could seem like a good idea, even to a narcissistic, insane person. Ah, that's 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 extremely interesting to hear uh, because it's the exact opposite of the way that I feel, which I think that this is hmm. really the only logical and rational uh, decision that he's made <laughs> since he's been president. <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay. This is good. I'm glad to have this conversation. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I, I think, it, I mean, I think it, I'm, I'm being like a little bit over emphatic to like, you know, to, to be funny, but like, uh, I think that, uh, there are a lot of good strategic reasons to want to own Greenland, right? Well, there's <laughs> like a that, lot of good strategic reasons to want to own everything. I mean- Right, 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 right. But I mean, Greenland is sort of, you know, looked at as this, well, it's just a big glacier, right? Like, what is there? There's nothing there. Uh, but like, uh, I think a lot of people don't know that after Saudi Arabia, uh, Russia is the world's largest exporter of oil. And it is uh, primed to become the world's largest exporter of oil as the... Well, I mean, everybody's converging on the Arctic and right. everybody knows the ice is going to melt and all the shit is going to be up there for people to harvest. Right. We all know that there's an arms race. I'm just saying, like, sure, it would be like great for rich people to own Greenland so that they could extract resources and make themselves richer. But it would take... Five minutes of research, even if you knew nothing about Denmark and nothing about Greenland, to determine that there was a zero percent chance <laughs> oh, yeah. that floating out okay. that suggestion okay. was going to produce any sort of positive result. All right. Well, then I, I guess, I guess when you say it that way, I agree with you. Um, uh, however, in the news coverage of buying Greenland, like I, the there has been absolutely zero attention paid to the fact that like uh trump is just a real estate guy he's a buy low sell high right he looks at greenland and he's like hey it's all snow now but soon you know like that, that uh right. that, i mean like but it's so deeply dumb yeah, yeah. to think that because you've bought and sold big buildings and golf courses that you can buy giant pieces of land owned by other countries <laughs> hey you guys aren't using it <laughs> you know like, oh. <laughs> yeah 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 i mean no. i don't know i mean it I is just crazy like... right like it is crazy but i think that i you know like to me what what that what, what's interesting about it is like it's it's all it's almost difficult to imagine the dimension of diabolical evil that that going through that thought process would would require like uh I do know that global warming is happening and uh, there is a climate crisis that is destroying the planet. Uh, nevertheless, I can make money <laughs> off of the very thing that's destroying the planet. Uh, so what if I buy uh, this massive chunk of land that has a bunch of oil under it, but isn't really of any other use? Uh, and yeah, I mean, I'll accelerate the process of... Uh, you know, mass extinction and uh, planetary death. But hey, you know, whatever. And I, I mean, well, that that it's weird. We're just on opposite wavelengths today. That is easy for me to understand. Like, I get that level of diabolical thinking. I feel like we're seeing it play out every single day. What I don't get is just the pure ineptitude, you know, like, <laughs> how could that idea have yeah. possibly been greenlit by anyone in charge of anything at a governmental level. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it was greenlit. I think he was just sort of going around saying it like he does. Um, well, he greenlit his own shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we're in more agreement than we thought we were. Uh, but the big news story, the bigger news story this week, and the one that sort of more fits into the theme of the show is that uh, the business roundtable, I, I didn't even know that the business roundtable existed. It's just a bunch of CEOs who get together and they draw it's up- It's an important thing. Yeah, I guess so. And they, they draw up some uh, rules for business, business rules. 
Um, that's what they do. They meet every once in a while, once a year or something. And uh, and this year they made a change since uh, 1997. Uh, they have made a fiduciary responsibility to shareholder value uh, the only thing that corporations uh, were responsible for. Uh, but this year they changed it uh, and they're saying corporations should be more responsible uh, to stakeholders, right? which means uh, other people who don't own. So the New York Times did a big thing on this. And then the Daily at the New York Times, their podcast, followed up on it. And yeah. we're going to talk about their coverage and comment on it, basically. Yeah. I mean, I, <clears throat> I guess so. I mean, uh, I, you know, I had I had a bit of a problem with the way that uh, I didn't I didn't read the article, but I did listen to part of the the podcast uh, where uh, Andrew Ross Sorkin was was talking about his article uh, that was kind of putting uh, this statement by the business roundtable into context. And uh, you know what what Sorkin is doing and and what the billionaires I mean they are they are. Uh, the, or the CEOs of the Business Roundtable, they are engaged in the same project, which is to tell a story about how capitalism works and what it is. And uh, if you notice, Sorkin and the Business Roundtable are telling the same story, which is that something happened in the 1980s, and it had to do with this valorization of fiduciary responsibility to shareholders right. uh, that changed capitalism from something that it was before that was better. I can play a, a quick clip All right. uh, from uh, The Daily. Uh, this is Sorkin talking about the way that he sees the issue. All right, play it. If you go back to the 1930s, possibly even earlier, the biggest corporations in America genuinely thought about the full plethora of constituents. Employees mattered. Customers mattered. Suppliers mattered. The profits mattered. But there was clearly a larger social compact that had been reached between companies and the rest of society. Well, I mean, I think that the, I, you know, the question to ask, right, uh, when you hear somebody say something like that is, uh, is that true? <laughs> right? Like, um, is it actually yeah. true that corporations from what he said, uh, 1930 to the 1970s, took it upon themselves to be more responsible to social stakeholders, to suppliers and employees uh, and things yeah. like this. Anyone who's seen the film Harlan County, USA would come to the conclusion <laughs> that the answer is no. Yeah, right? Like, <laughs> like, have you not heard of the uh, the labor movement in the United States, right? Like that, that uh, the gains... That Im that that uh, workers saw uh, from corporations were hard fought for. Uh, they were not given by corporations to workers. I, I hear exactly where you're going with this. I think like if we're going to give Andrew Ross Sorkin the benefit of the doubt, there was a shift. Okay, so this is this is the one point that I want to make, and I don't have much of an argument about this, but this is like this is it, right? Like when you frame the history as Sorkin did, what it does is to implicitly argue that there can be a caring capitalism, that there can be a moral form of capitalism that does, in fact, uh, support the interests of all stakeholders in society, which means everybody that the corporation affects. I do right? believe in righteous commerce. Yes, exactly. Right. Like this is some like Oprah shit, right? Like that. That's not what happened, right? There were structural reasons. There were there were antagonisms in society that led corporations to make calculations that the best way to go about business at that particular time uh, was to uh, give certain concessions in certain areas so that there wasn't backlash against them. And they fought and fought and fought against that 
uh, impulse until the 1980s when uh, they when there was a political revolution and they saw that nobody was going to, you know, pull back the reins. Yeah. Right. Like that. That it, As soon as they felt the slack in that rope, they tightened they it. They took down. it. Right. They yeah. took off. Right. And so there there is no sort of morality uh, that is uh, 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 internal to capitalist thinking. It is only about accumulation. Right. Like that's the only and what thing you can get away with. And, and- different historical contexts. Yeah, it's what you can get away with, right? Like that's that's the only uh that's the the only principle uh of uh, capitalist enterprise is to get away with everything that you can get away with at any time. The interesting the shift that happened in the 80s though is very interesting, right? And and this gets to all of the discussions that we've been having about philanthropy uh over the course of this podcast. There's a wormhole here to the Ray Dalio conversation we were having much earlier yes, in, the, yeah. in the show. But like what what happened in the 80s in this sort of valorization of fiduciary responsibility to shareholder value, like what that did was to say the corporation as a as a social institution cannot be influenced by any other social institutions. Like it's sorry guys, it's in our rules. Like it it's part of <laughs> like it's part of our rules as a corporation. What it means is that our primary responsibility has to be to shareholder value. But the th- the interesting thing that that it, that those rules don't say is that the corporation can influence the decision-making processes of any other institution that it wants, right? Yeah. And so the the corporation uh then ideologically uh inserts itself into education and healthcare, uh, into religion, into every other social subsystem that exists. There's this kind of corporate colonization of the ways that those institutions work. The story that there is, uh, as Joe said a minute ago, uh, righteous commerce, uh, that there is uh, compassionate capitalism. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's it's not true. It's a lie, right? It's a negotiating position that they're taking up to try to convince you to not advocate for real political change. All right, we're on to billionaire number one for the week. Uh, Joe, you're going first. Uh, Who do you got? The random billionaire generator last episode called up Blair Perry Okaden, born in Hawaii. She has spent the last several decades living on a farm in Australia. So even compared to like the many other billionaires that we're looking at who intentionally keep a low profile. Blair Perry Okaden is exceptionally low key. Google her. You'll find, <laughs> you'll find headlines like the reclusive American heiress who is Australia's richest person. Whoa. Australia's richest person. Definitely. Uh, one of the richest that at any given moment in time, that's one headline okay, maybe yeah. from a couple of years ago. Um, she's a- among the richest women, if not the richest women. She's like worth $10 billion. Wow. So there's not really anything to know about this person other than the family that she came from. And I'm going to talk about that family in a, in a few moments here. I'll just float out one interesting detail that I've pulled from an article in the Sydney Morning Herald, which states, quote, in Australia, her family's most conspicuous spending is made by her two sons, Andrew and Henry. Their names appear on an honor roll at Taronga Zoo, recording the $500 <laughs> in sponsorship they give to the institution's ring-tailed possums Whoa. each year. <laughs> what? That's, that's what we got. Her kids give money to possums. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Friends, this is in the same article, another quote, quote, friends described Miss Perry Okaden as a private woman, but quote, she is interesting, (laughs) private and interesting. The only other thing that you're going to find out about her, aside from her inheritance in the family, is that she wrote a children's book in the late 80s called down by the gate. It's like a, that sounds very like Kafka-esque, like before the door. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, <laughs> there might be the some gate. interesting connections there. It's apparently about an ad Mother Goose places in a newspaper. 
And I, I, I tried to get my hands on a copy. I couldn't. I, I could have contacted the National Library of Australia, and they might have been able to scan a copy for me for like 30 or 40 bucks. But I figured, you know, eh, there's only so much I'm willing to do for the show. You know, sometimes it's more fun to just kind of imagine what it could be. Yeah. Yeah. So Blair Perry Okaden is the heiress to Cox Enterprises. Do you know what Cox is? Have you heard of Cox before this? I mean, I just know Cox Cable. Okay. So Cox Cable is one part of Cox Enterprises. The company was originally founded in 1898 by James M. Cox. James Cox purchased the Dayton Daily News, which is still owned by Cox Enterprises today, back in 1898. James Cox went on to serve as the governor of Ohio before becoming the Democratic nominee for president in 1920. FDR was his running mate. Obviously, he lost. So today, Blair Perry Ogden owns 25% of the company. Do you know where the family is from? Are they from Boston? Well, the business is located in Atlanta, but I think the family is rather far flung these days. I meant back in the uh, old timey days. Well, Ohio is their deepest uh, connection. Perry Ogden's brother, Jim Kennedy, who's the current chair of Cox Enterprises, also owns 25% of the, of the company. And then her aunt, Ann Cox Chambers, who's 99 years old, <laughs> owns 49% of the company. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the family. Really, I'll wind up focusing on one of the descendants of James M. Cox, who is the current CEO. But generally, the, the family was described by one Forbes article I, I read as mm. being characterized by soft-spoken conservatism. Mm. They describe how Kennedy, who's uh, Perry Okaden's brother, drives a Prius, and surprise, surprise, he almost never, ever talks to the media. Mm -hmm. in, in this 2015 Forbes article that I read, they, uh, they assert that this was the first interview that he had given in over a decade. And he has a quote in the article that sort of says it all. Quote, create noise, and then it's a good time for people to take shots at you, says Kennedy, 67, raspy voiced. Quote, We've purposely kept a very guarded shell around us. I think it served us well. <laughs> you know, this is a company yeah. that's worth almost like $30 billion. You know, so. <laughs> you know what I'm, I mean, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but you know what I'm realizing is that um, <clears throat> these kinds of aphorisms circulate between billionaires. Yeah. One of the, I'm going to play a clip later on from uh, the, one of the billionaires that uh, I'm covering. And uh, he, uh, I'm not going to play this in the clip. I excerpted it, but he's he's giving a speech uh, where he's accepting an award, and he opens the speech with, "The whale that spouts gets harpooned." I don't like public attention. Yeah. You know. Um, well, well, of course. Uh, like, I, I mean, this is the whole point of our show. <laughs> yeah. We keep harping right. on it. They all know. We're going to keep, all know what and we're going to continue to harp on it because yeah. I just think it's really important to just be yeah. bang this drum. You know, I hear, Absolutely. I hear shit yeah. like this and I'm like, the world is so unbelievably stupid. Like these people are hiding in plain sight with all the money and we yeah. just like let them hide. That's a incredibly good point. You, you talk about fiduciary responsibility to, to uh, shareholders. It's like in the broad sense, we're all fucking shareholders here. <laughs> you know, we're all stakeholders. Definitely. You know, and we deserve to like interrogate these people, you know? Yeah, <clears throat> that's, you know, I, I don't think that we come back to that point enough, uh, but that was, that was like the founding premise of this entire show, which is that these people are actively trying to hide. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. if we, if we, you know, uh, acquiesce to their wishes to, to not, uh, uh, have publicity uh, about them, then we are doing their bidding, right? right? Like, yeah. and uh, and they are by and large terrible people doing terrible things, uh, and uh, and so we should talk about them all the time. So the money for this company originally came from newspapers, the Dayton newspaper that I mentioned earlier. I think James M. Cox went on to buy a newspaper in Atlanta. Today, 
Cox Enterprises owns many, many different companies, but they're split up into three primary divisions. Cable, which is worth $10 billion. Cox Automotive, which is roughly $6 billion. Automotive. What's up? I've never heard of that. Co- yeah, Cox Automotive. I'm going to talk more about Cox Automotive in a second. And then Cox Media is their smallest segment of the company. But this is a company that's reinvented itself over time. I think it's an interesting question to consider, like, how do old businesses become new businesses? And how do they, you know, this is a business that's been around over 100 years. It's gone through a lot of different phases and continues to try to imagine itself into the future. Mm -hmm. It's also a family business and a privately held business. And although family businesses do constitute the majority of businesses in, in America, only certain percentages of them are uh, viable for multiple generations. So about half uh, successfully make it from first generation to the second, uh, less than that, make it from second to third, only 3% make it to the fourth generation, which is what Cox is. It's an interesting, interesting statistic. Yeah. So being a newspaper business, Cox had automotive classifieds all the time. They had a very close relationship with the automotive industry. That was a big source of revenue for them decades ago. And this led them uh, back in the 90s, I think, to begin trying to, to imagine what they might do with this moving into the future. And they started to invest heavily. Do they own Auto Trader? They own Auto Trader. What? Oh, no. (laughs) I can't believe I guessed that. That's a. Yeah, you guessed it. That's kind of amazing. Auto Trader is a subculture. Like Auto Trader people are like uh have an identity. I don't know that much about it. But what I do know is that Cox pumped 250 million dollars into developing Auto Trader before it made any money at all. Huh. Which which sort of gives you a window onto like angel investment and and you know silicon valley investment culture i mean you need massive amounts of money to make massive amounts of money in so many cases so in preparation for the show i actually watched a couple of hour long interviews with alex taylor who is the great great grandson of james m cox and the current ceo of the company and mm-hmm. i'm going to talk a little bit about some things that I encountered in these lectures that he's given at various uh, uh, business schools. So he's compared to the rest of his family, he keeps a slightly higher profile if you can find these videos on YouTube. So anyway, Alex Taylor presents as like a mild mannered, thoughtful, even handed and mature guy. He's relatively articulate. He's not immediately objectionable. (laughs) Other than being groomed to run the family business, his primary claim to fame is that he went on a worldwide fly fishing adventure and he wrote a book about it called The Longest Cast, The Fly Fishing Journey of a Lifetime. So I pulled some quotes from this one interview that he gave at Wichita State University Center for Entrepreneurship in 2015. And maybe some of these quotes will spark different things for us to talk about, or maybe throw light on his worldview and in certain ways. I'm not going to dwell too much on any one point, but we'll just burn, burn through some things I heard him say. You ready? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So here's the first quote. It's not, you know, spectacularly fascinating in any one way, but he says, quote, because we're a private business, nobody knows what we do but we do a lot of fun stuff, end quote. So I heard this and it made me think it might be interesting to talk just a little bit about the difference between public and private businesses. Is is one categorically more problematic than the other? That's a great question. I don't know. Maybe it's something I for mean, us to think about more in the future. In I, the news segment, we were talking about you know the fact that publicly traded companies uh, have this uh, completely made up and fictional uh, fiduciary responsibility to shareholder value. Yeah. Uh, that makes them do really bad things, you know. And and one of the things that we didn't say in the news segment is that uh, these corporations can't change. And the reason that they can't change is because if they don't hold 
uh, fiduciary responsibility to shareholder value as the primary goal of the business, then they make themselves susceptible to hostile takeover by private equity mm. or, you know, or, or leverage mm. buyout or whatever. Like if they're not maximizing profits, then somebody's just going to fire everybody and, and dismantle the business or radically, you know, change it. Um, so that's like super bad. But the problem with privately held companies is that- They're a locked box. You, you don't have no know idea what, what they're yeah, doing. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> an interesting thing to think about and something that maybe we can be thinking about more intentionally moving forward. Okay. Another moment of the lecture that I thought that sort of jumped out at me, I'm going to paraphrase this, but he says something to the effect of, Facebook didn't make money forever. Twitter doesn't make money now. And then he says- Netflix doesn't make any money. And then a minute later or a, a moment later, he's like, Netflix does make a little money, but not much. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I mean, the sort of lack of perspective uh, is, is difficult for me to fathom. I mean, Cox is worth $32 billion, which is a little bit less than half of what Facebook is worth. So, you know, th that's a giant company. And he's just like, Netflix... Yeah isn't even a serious business. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you have anything yeah. to say to that or if it's just sort of self-explanatory. Well, I mean, you know, uh, you know, this is aspirational capitalism. I mean, you, Uber is the poster child for this, right? Yeah. Like that uh, the writing is sort of on the wall that Uber is going to crash and burn and just sort of disintegrate into nothingness. And what happens when that happens? You know, yeah. uh, uh, what do all of the people who uh, pay their rent with Uber and Lyft uh, do uh, when it goes away? Speaking of aspirational capitalism, Alex Taylor goes on at length about how impressed he is with Theranos. <laughs> <laughs> well, well uh, yeah so this was like there's like before. two minutes of him telling the whole <laughs> story of elizabeth holmes and how she convinced her stanford professor to quit his job oh, and come awesome. work with him and the whole dream of one drop of blood cox invested a hundred million dollars in theranos <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> but it's basically a drop in the bucket for them. A few minutes later, he's outlining some of the things that the company is interested in representing and, and interested in investing in. He says, we like sustainability. We like healthcare. We like media. Who doesn't? Right. Oh, yeah. Love those things. There's a sort of environmental streak that runs through this company. Not long ago, they invested in Sierra Energy, a company that wants to turn trash into clean energy. And he's really excited about that. And they have different environmental initiatives and give money to different environmentalist things. But at the end of the day, all of this seems like pretty toothless. And while I've been just summarizing up until this point, I thought I would take this moment to play just one clip from this Wichita yeah. State lecture which illustrates, I think, in a pretty concrete way, the toothlessness of the commitment to environmentalism. I mean, I don't even need to go into the fact that one third of their business is automotive, you know, which is like, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but this, I think, is, is, is pretty perfect. We, we have less opportunity because there's not as many businesses that we'll get into because some things are just not attractive businesses to us. They don't get us up in the morning. They don't fire us up. I mean, going in... Um, this is no offense to anything someone might do, but you know, going and blowing up a mountain in Canada and extracting the molybdenum and selling it to a, a battery maker in China is just something that doesn't wake me up in the morning. You know who it does wake up in the morning? Ira Rennert uh, from last week. That's exactly what he does. Heavy metals mining <laughs> that poisons communities. Right? It's, he's, very, he's very casual about it. He's like, eh, it just doesn't get me up in the morning. Like, well, I mean, that's my point, you know, like he s sort of postures as though he has some I environmentalist integrity, but in the same breath, he's just like, no offense to the mountaintop removal guys. You know, I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> solid, they're yeah. solid guys. They're good guys. But it's just like, it's not yeah. my kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It just seems like weak to me. Okay. I want to finish the segment by talking about coupons and here's why. Cox 
owns Valpac. You know Valpac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, where uh, do you get those? Are they? They come in the mail. They come in the mail. Yeah. Don't you get them in the mail? Yeah. I mean, I remember it's like V-A-L and then there's a dot and P-A-K. Like, I, I remember seeing them. I just don't remember the context I saw them in. They're like mailers. I mean, I'm guessing you could probably get them other places, but yeah. they just send them out. And I think there's something weirdly funny about coupons that I can't quite put my finger on. I'm not suggesting that it's funny that people who work hard are trying to save money by using coupons. No, coupons are I just are think like great. more at the, like the ontological level or even the sound of the word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a funny word. The first company to ever issue a coupon was Coca-Cola. So you can file that in your archive of trivia. We've talked about rebate scams. We've talked about how gift cards are problematic. Coupons aren't nearly as bad, I don't think, but they are maybe bad in certain ways. And I wanted to outline a few different reasons why using coupons may create problems for consumers. I think like if you're the average consumer who occasionally is just using a coupon to save money, it's hard to like pinpoint any real problem with that from my perspective. But if you're like a regular coupon user who is sort of shopping based on the coupons that you have in your possession, there are a couple of pitfalls that you might run into. Can you guess any of these? Uh, nutrition. That's actually probably true, but I didn't think of that. I mean, one thing that I notice is like the things that have coupons are almost always like junk food and soda. I think, and yeah, like I that. think that falls into the category of regular coupon users often buy things they don't need. So you don't need junk food. Oh, yeah. Um, and maybe also into the category of regular coupon users buy more than they need. So, ah, yeah. And these are all things that psychology research has shown over the last however many years. Any other guesses about why coupons aren't necessarily great for people? Uh, they're wasteful. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a lot of paper. Yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> the re regular coupon users tend to pay less attention to the actual price. So they have a coupon, they think they're getting a great deal, but the the actual price may be higher than it should be. And so people oftentimes actually wind up paying more money than they would have if they hadn't gotten involved in a coupon bargain. I'm going to end the segment by playing a clip from one of my favorite comedy sketches, Coupon the Movie, Mr. Show. This is the biggest failure in movie history. Coupon the Movie has made zero money. You people are responsible. I want to know what the hell happened. Look, the reports show that's the most popular coupon in the country. Everyone uses it. I don't get it. People love the coupon. They should love the movie. Well, they don't. And what I want to know is, who green-lighted this picture? So who who are you talking about today, Chad? Uh, I'm talking about Richard Peary, P-E-E-R-Y. Uh, he goes by Dick Peary. Okay. I'll give you a quick bio first. Uh, he inherited his wealth. He's from Palo Alto, California. His uh, father was in banking and real estate. He went to business school, uh, and uh, in the in the early 1960s, he partnered with a guy named uh, John Ariaga. And so, I'm going to be covering both of them today because there's there's not really any reason to talk about them separately. Uh, okay. They have the exact same career. Uh, okay. Their their backgrounds are a little bit different. Uh, whereas uh, Piri uh, inherited his wealth, uh, uh, Ariaga. Uh, went to Stanford on a basketball scholarship and uh, uh, partnered with uh, Peary uh, immediately upon graduating. And uh, hmm. so what they did, the way that they made their fortunes uh, was as real estate magnates in Silicon Valley. 
they're uh, two of the only people who are billionaires in Silicon Valley who did not make their money from tech. I think there are two other... There's another real estate duo who did the same thing, but I think that uh, uh, outside of those four, uh, they're the only ones who are not are, are non tech billionaires. So how did they do it? Did they buy up a bunch of land, or did they? Yeah, um, basically, uh, they bought a bunch of fruit fruit orchards and they turned them into office parks for the burgeoning tech industry in the 1960s. Um, and so you might ask, why Silicon Valley? Uh, why fruit orchards? I do ask, why Silicon Valley and why fruit orchards? <laughs> well, uh, there's a very simple answer. Uh, it's because the inventor of the transistor, uh, William Shockley, was from Palo Alto also, and he opened uh, his uh, transistor uh, factory slash uh, uh, sales operation in uh, Silicon Valley. It wasn't you called know, Silicon Valley then. I think th this is something interesting because I I don't know what it is, but I feel like whenever there's an opportunity to offer an example of like the most elemental infrastructural component, I always choose the transistor. It seems like the most basic thing. As a as an electronics hobbyist, I will uh, I will say that the transistor is really not that basic. In fact, it it, it was a major uh, innovation in electronics. Uh, uh, but before that, most of the simple electronic components already existed. Uh, a, a transistor can do a lot of things. Uh, essentially, it's an amplifier. Uh, but uh, computer processors, the chips that make your computers go are just transistor arrays, right? And so hmm. what the, the invention of the transistor meant was uh, the computer revolution. Uh, prior to that, there were a few computers, but they were made of vacuum tubes and they were the size of, you know, uh, a house, right? Uh, 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 and so the thing that allowed computers to become uh, portable devices that people could use or even have on a desktop was the the transistor. It shrunk. When things. was the transistor invented? Uh, the transistor was invented in the 50s and they didn't really become commercially viable uh, until, you know, Shockley started selling them in the early 60s. I think 64, he opened uh, his place in Palo Alto. Huh. Okay. And uh, that's interesting. Almost immediately after that, Piri and Ariaga started buying up fruit orchards and and building office buildings uh, for new businesses. And 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 I want to talk about Shockley for a minute uh, because I I I I feel like most people don't know that the guy who started the computer revolution is one of the most vile human beings to ever exist. I don't know this, but I feel like I've heard his name before. Yeah, this is not the well, first time I've I've come across this. Uh, Shockley Man. is a, uh, he was, uh, famous for inventing the transistor, but also famous for being a white supremacist and eugenicist. Uh, he, oh, no shit. yeah, very bad. And in fact, before he died, uh, in the eighties, he said that his contributions <laughs> to race science were more valuable than his invention of the transistor. Uh, he, he was utterly convinced and made it his life's mission, uh, from about like, 19, you know, the 1970s on to convince people that IQ and race uh, were biologically correlated with one another. Very intellectual dark web uh, Quillette kind of stuff. He uh, He's kicking it hard with Jeffrey Epstein right now. Yeah, for real. Uh, he was he was uh, he was just a terrible person. Um, but the reason that Silicon Valley exists is because he wasn't just a terrible person, but he was also a terrible boss. Uh, and so he started this company to sell transistors in Silicon Valley, and he was so bad that everybody quit and started their own company. And so there's this this group of people called the Traitorous Eight uh, who left Shockley and started their own company. And that was the primal scene of uh, Silicon Valley. If you want to know a little bit about Shockley, uh, I, I thought uh, I thought I would read a little bit from the New York Times obituary of, of Shockley. Quote, his theory on racial differences set off a national argument over the use and acceptability of IQ tests. Evidence that blacks tend to score lower than whites was discounted by most experts who saw the explanation in cultural and social rather than genetic terms. 
Stanford University, which announced uh, the death of Shockley yesterday, said Dr. Shockley regarded his work on race as more important than his discovery of the transistor. Quoting his wife, the announcement said he continued to sift data and prepare papers on it until a few days before he died. Dr. Shockley had alienated many of his fellow scientists by straying far beyond his ken. He drew further scorn when he proposed financial rewards for the genetically disadvantaged if they volunteered for sterilization. Oh, my God. He, <laughs> he sued the Atlanta Constitution for a 1980 column likening uh, that suggestion to, a not, to Nazi experiments in genetic engineering. In 1984, a federal jury in Atlanta found that he had been libeled but awarded him just $1 in damages. What? Um, Last, uh, Dr. Shockley had also raised some eyebrows when, at the age of 68, he contributed more than once to a California sperm bank mired in controversy for a project offering to pass along the genes of geniuses. Uh, He was a complete psycho. He made his employees take lie detector tests uh, and, uh, like, uh, because... Like someone in the office got a cut on a, like a pin and and he was like obsessed with finding out who left the pin where it shouldn't be. And so like, I mean, just just a complete psychopath. Um, and that's the wow. guy who is responsible for computers and Silicon Valley existing in the first place. Um, and lastly, uh, that's crazy. He also thought that the welfare state uh, and uh, and charity uh, prevented natural selection from killing off the bottom of the population. Oh my uh, fucking god! He is, uh, wow. but what what's very interesting, and I I wish I could take credit for making this connection, but I can't. What, what what's very interesting is that that obsession with IQ tests, uh, uh, being a kind of like egomaniac, the, this idea that the self is a quantifiable thing uh, that's understandable in purely material terms. Uh, the, uh, the idea that there is an elite sector of society that, that is meant naturally meant to rule over, uh, other sectors. I, all of this stuff still is very pervasive in Silicon Valley culture. That's really interesting. Wow. You know, that's a, a slight tangent into the milieu that uh, Piri and Ariaga were uh, dealing with. But, you know, basically they're uh, the, the classic story of inherited fortune plus being in the right place at the right time. How old are they? How old are they now? Uh, they're they're uh, late seventies. Uh, one's eighty. One's I think seventy seven or something like that. Uh, they were the biggest corporate landlords in Silicon Valley at their height. Uh, however, they sold half of their business in two thousand six to a uh, a place called Reef. It's R R E E F. Uh, Reef is a REIT. Ah. Uh, we know what REITs are. We've talked about them yeah. a number of times. Uh, what's amazing is that. They sold immediately before uh, the the crash uh, in 2006, uh, when like almost right after uh, Piri and Arigula sold uh, to Reef, uh, Reef's stock price went from thirty dollars on down 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 to six dollars and fifty cents a share. So, what are we to make of that? They're super smart or super shady? Kinda, uh- uh, you know, I think I don't know. I thought about this a little bit. Uh, I don't think they're super shady, actually. Uh, I think that uh, what happened was that they saw the bubble. I mean, they'd been in real estate since the mm-hmm. early '60s, and they were like, "These prices are out of control," especially in California, right? Like, I mean, there were stories of like uh, middle-income people owning six mansions and stuff like that because they could get loans mm-hmm. from anywhere. They just saw it happening. They saw it happening. They're like, let's unload some of this stuff. But what what I want to talk about is this, you know, it, this is a, a kind of a pet interest of the show. We like to talk about infrastructure. Uh, we talked about drywall on our very first episode. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about what stands behind that drywall in Silicon Valley office space, and uh, it's concrete. We could do an entire podcast of 500 episodes on concrete. There's a lot going on with concrete. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Um, Well, these guys are big concrete guys. What's very funny is I did a lot of research about tilt-ups, which we're going to talk about in a second. What is a tilt-up? Tilt-up? Is that right? Tilt-up? Tilt-up, yeah. Uh, Tilt-up. 
uh, Amish people doing barn raisings. Yep. So you know how they build the frame of the wall mm-hmm. on the ground and then they use ropes to pull it up? Yep. That's what a tilt up is, but it's concrete and cranes instead of wood and people. Okay. Uh, you, you, you make a concrete wall on the ground and then you get a crane to pull that, that, that flat concrete slab up. Uh, like big, but big box stores are very often tilt ups, like a Home Depot or something like that. Like there's these big concrete slabs that make up the walls. Okay, got it. And they're usually fine, right? You know that that it's a very cheap, efficient, and quick way to make a building. Uh, Silicon Valley is very famous for its tilt ups uh, because it has a really high concentration of them because of Peary and Arigula, that particular real estate firm, and because of the time in which all of the office space was built, right? After the kind of Shockley boom, they needed a bunch of office space really quickly and really cheaply. And these two billionaires were the guys who supplied that, right? Okay. Let me let me see if you can guess this. Uh, uh, can you imagine any problems for a very large box shaped, rigid uh, concrete building uh, uh, that's built on top of uh, a, a, a a a very earthquake prone zone? <laughs> <laughs> nope. It sounds great. It sounds one hundred percent rock solid. What these guys did is is they made a bunch of tilt ups. In a, in a highly earthquake prone zone because it was very profitable for them. Question, was there, was there someone at the time being like, you know, we have earthquakes here and this isn't going to work very well when an earthquake occurs or was it not really on their radar? Uh, let me read you a quote uh, from an article called Tilting at Danger. Loose soils and cheap construction clash in the Silicon Valley's Golden Mm. Triangle. So, quote, uh, the first dramatic warning about the seismic deficiencies of tilt-ups came during the 1964 Alaskan earthquake, uh, magnitude 8.4, in which three of the five bays of an Elmendorf Air Force Base warehouse fell to the ground. Since then, improvements to the uniform building code have been largely reactive. And what that means, as a very subtle way to to put, uh, is that uh, uh, the building codes uh, were really slow to catch up uh, to the known deficiencies of tilt-ups in earthquake-prone zones. And even after they were known, there were no uh, laws that were passed for retrofitting uh, tilt ups to be more safe. Where are we in history right now? Where are we in history uh, is right now. Currently, there are thousands, like 5,500 or so, uh, tilt up buildings that have not been retrofitted in Silicon Valley. That when the big one hits, the concrete ceilings are going to fall in on the thousands of workers inside and kill and them. And no, right? like there's no uh, mechanism in place to enforce any sort of Improvement? Not to enforce it. Uh, businesses can do it voluntarily. Um, uh, there are retrofitting procedures. Uh, but from what I read, uh, most buildings uh, have not been retrofitted. What are the stats? Do you, do you have the probability for the big one? Like, when is it going to hit? Like, what are... Yeah, in fact, I do. The United States Geological Survey says that there's a 67% chance that the San Francisco Bay Area will suffer a magnitude 7 or above earthquake between 1990 and 2020. And it hasn't happened yet? Uh, (laughs) It has not happened yet. But even a moderate earthquake like the 6.7 magnitude quake that struck Northridge in 1994 could cause hundreds of Silicon Valley's most densely populated buildings to literally shake apart, end quote. So um, these guys. Those are that's scary odds. uh, Very bad odds uh, for workers in Silicon Valley. And uh, I mean, this will make the shirtwaist fire uh, look like, uh, you know, like a picnic uh, uh, if that happens. Right. Like there there will literally be tens of thousands of people uh, at risk. Luckily, you know, uh, most earthquakes that have happened that have caused major damage to these kinds of buildings have happened on off work hours. Right. They've happened in the middle of the night or whatever. Jesus. Uh, They're both very into like smart philanthropy or data driven philanthropy uh, to the degree that uh, uh, 
uh, Ariaga's daughter, Laura Ariago Andreessen. Uh, and if you notice, uh, uh, Andreessen is also the last name of the founder of Netscape, uh, who she is married to. He's also a, a billionaire in Silicon Valley. But uh, I, I want to I, let me read you a little quote from uh, our, her uh, self-authored biography uh, on her website, uh, laugh.org. And that's L-A-A-F. It's it's her initials uh, plus an F for foundation. She says, uh, I'm an individual philanthropist who's also what I call a pracademic. Ugh. Part practitioner, part scholar. I've spent the last 21 years of my career creating the resources, organizations, and courses that I wish I could have had to make my philanthropy create a greater impact at every stage of my giving life. So what she does, she runs a consulting firm for philanthropists. Like <laughs> no that's shit. what she does. That's yeah, it's just the most disgusting line of work that you could have possibly no, imagined there, someone being. There are in. way more disgusting lines of work, but it's it's perverse. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's true, but it's a scam, and I, I'm going to tell you why it's a scam uh, as well. I have evidence to demonstrate that it's a scam. She's a leading vo- She wrote a bestseller called Giving 2.0, which is also cringe-inducing. Uh, she, like, that uh, uh, people follow her advice. She's a leading voice in, like, doing impactful philanthropy. She has, uh, you know, uh, 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 created a middle management class to extract capital out of the philanthropy uh, process. Out of philanthropists before yeah. it gets to the causes that philanthropists are I mean, are it's shitty. Giving it's clearly to. shitty. It's not good. Yeah. Uh, and that's what she does. She's also, and what, one thing that I thought was funny, she runs the Silicon Valley Social Venture Fund, which she calls SV2. That's a 501c3. It's a charitable giving organization. The reason she calls it SV2 is because it's a spinoff of the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Do you remember I that? I do. I do. Yeah. That's who Jan Coombe right. and Mark Zuckerberg the and Porsche, Jack Dorsey. The Porsche guy. Uh-huh. And go and most famously, the subject of the New York Times expose GoPro founder Nick Woodman. Oh, yeah. Uh, they all used it as a donor advised right. fund Daft. to get huge tax break, tax breaks. They dump yeah. Daft Punk, they 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 dump Soon to be valueless stock, right? Stock that they think is going to tank into this place. And then they take tax breaks on the full value of that stock at the time that they donated it. It's a big scam. And they all use this place. And she runs a spinoff of that. And I think she's trying to do the same thing. So I looked up their 990 tax forms. ProPublica hosts all the 990 tax forms of 501c3s. What's interesting is that uh, SV2 is small. Uh, it gives away five hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, it also pays four hundred and ten thousand dollars in salaries per year. And when you add benefits, rent, uh, other expenses, et cetera, uh, uh, if you add that up on their tax forms, it costs them eight hundred thousand dollars a year to run the place. And they're giving and how away much are they giving fa- away? They're giving away five hundred thousand dollars a year. So it costs, it costs them eight hundred thousand dollars a year to run it. So it runs a charity that costs more to run than it actually gives away. That's pretty unbelievable. Well, okay, let's not be too hard on her. Maybe her consulting firm is helping all of the other billionaires give away their money in better ways. No, not true. In a recent TechCrunch profile of her uh, about her data-driven philanthropy, which li- uh, which I do want to point out, and I will link this in the show description, lists no accomplishments other than that she teaches a course on data-driven philanthropy at Stanford. And one wonders how she got that job uh, being the daughter of uh, uh, <laughs> the guy whose name is on half of the buildings at Stanford. <laughs> um, uh, the, she like That's the only accomplishment that the article lists that she's had. The, but the only specific note of something that she's done is that she has advised Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla Chan on their $100 million gift to Newark schools. And 
I don't know if you remember the Zuckerberg gift to Newark schools. I don't. Uh, it was about no. 10 years ago. This happened in 2010. No. But it involves our old friend, Cory Booker, who we've, we've I figured it. I of. figured it might. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, the, this, this was a big deal. Cory Booker and Chris Christie teamed up to lobby Mark Zuckerberg to donate a hundred million dollars to to uh, 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 Newark Public Schools, and Mark Zuckerberg agreed, but only if there was another hundred million dollars matched. So this was a and they and they got it, and so this was a two hundred million dollar windfall donation to Newark Public Schools, a high poverty, low performing school district. They announced it on Oprah. Hmm. It was a big deal. Everybody was talking about it. What happened? The outcome of these donations was so bad that a, a, a journalist from the Washington Post, Dale Russikoff, wrote an entire book about it, about the massive failure of this donation. Well, um, distill it in two or three main points. Okay. So basically what they did was to not consult anybody who lived in Newark, and they created a board uh, uh, who made the decisions. Uh, but the only people who were allowed to be on that board were people who had given $10 million or more, uh, to the fund. Uh, so those people had no idea what was going on in Newark and knew zero about public education because they were just private equity people and tech people. So what happened? They gave $60 million to charter schools. They gave $50 million to undermining the teachers union by uh, buying out contracts and raising teacher pay to negotiate for weaker tenure protections and uh, and also having merit-based salaries. Uh, $21 million went to consultants and analytic firms. So just <laughs> and tw- every penny and was misspent. And went some- to other philanthropic foundations. Yeah. So basically, they did nothing but undermine the union. So we hate unions. And also they gave the bulk of the money, like a, a like a large part of the money to charter schools. They just like did a bunch of charter startups. What was the result? Nothing. No change. No real change in, uh, in anything uh, in terms of outcomes in Newark public schools. There's a huge New York, New Yorker article about this. Uh, I'll link to in the show description. That's really sad. There was a slight bump in some test scores, right? But they spent $200 million to get practically no result. Um, uh, so the legacy of, uh, uh, you know, Laura Arigula Andreessen's consulting firm is uh, that she does not seem to know what she's doing. And also, I just I just want to, you know, just because we mentioned it on the show before, that uh, part of Cory Booker's presidential campaign right now is he is desperately trying to distance himself from his previous support of charter schools. He's in this very awkward position of being this big charter school guy who billionaires took advantage of and tried to privatize the New York. Newark public school system to prove that their stupid uh, and fake charter school system would work. And when it didn't, Cory Booker got embarrassed. And uh, and so now he's like, I love teachers unions and I love public education wow. and, and I love solutions that work. So, you know, uh, one wonders uh, what evidence there is that this uh, entire industry of uh, philanthropic consulting uh, where you know a bunch of people who don't seem to know anything are advising billionaires on where they should put their money uh, uh, actually works, right? Like you know, uh, what evidence is there that this class of people who are extracting money from uh, that would otherwise go to uh, philanthropic causes are doing any good, right? Like I, I don't yeah. see any evidence for that. Yeah. Wow. All right, it's that time. Let's pick the billionaires for next episode. Do you have the uh, random billionaire generator ready? Yeah, I do. You're you gonna have spend, any hopes? The, spend the. Do you ever like? Wheel? Do you ever hope someone's gonna come up? I hope someone won't come up, but I'll talk about that some other day. Okay. Huh?
Conrad Priebus. Conrad Priebus, Progress Construction and Management Company. No relation to Co-founder and owner. Uh, and, and also not spelled the same way. This is spelled P-R-E-B-Y-S. Okay. Conrad Priebus. You, you say construction? Mm-hmm. Conrad is a serious rich person's name. It is, yeah. And I also don't think that we've had too many construction people, so this should be good. Okay. All right. Uh, Let's spin it again. two, spinning it again. The billionaire, the second billionaire. Oh, my gosh. It's a married couple, Bharat and Nirja, Sethi Dasal, owner of Sintel, chairman and co-founder. Uh, their main business is outsourcing. So okay, uh, so I think these... did, didn't I get to choose last time? I can't remember. But would you, why don't you choose? Uh, I kind of want to do the outsourcing people. I All mean, right. that's that's a rare that's a rare thing for us. Uh, yeah, you take learned... outsourcing. I'll take construction. Outsourcing will be interesting, but construction, I don't know. We'll figure it out. I'll do it. That sounds good. Yeah, everybody. Thank you very much again. Uh, I love to see those numbers go up each week. Uh, yeah, it, thanks you know, so much. It, it's really satisfying. And yeah. we're having a lot of fun, even in the face of all of the horror. <laughs>